Hello and good morning. Welcome to another installment of spiritual health. Uh, as usual, we have Dr. Maya with us. Today we're going to deal with some physical health matters or reproductive health matters. Uh, so we're dealing with the prostate and the ovaries this morning, now. Yeah, we're going to we're going to um, do some do some work on on uh, the prostate. But we're going to do that work where you know, just sit down and say, use this for this. You know, that that really doesn't give us a picture. You know, you go through. I notice when you have modern books now um, that are written for doctors, they will give you the organ, they'll give you the disease, they'll give you how to treat it. But they'll never tell you how the disease starts, where it comes from what it has to do to the immune system in order to get there. So we can take a slightly different approach. We'll say, okay, we're doing prostate. A lot of people have swollen prostates. Is that a thing that, that the human race had had to suffer from since Adam, you know? And God say, okay, Adam, go downstairs, go into the garden of Eden and carry some prostate problems when you reach 50. <laughs> <laughs> Was, uh, from creation, uh, you know, but you understand. You yeah. can you can reduce the thing to the ridiculous, yeah. and very often we don't know where it arises, so we don't know how to fix it. Mm. That that information is kind of blocked. Mm. So we're going to take the prostate this morning, and we're going to start from mm. from day one, mm -hmm. and we'll talk about what happens in the prostate. Um, and then we will gradually come up, you know, and, and see, see how that, that whole thing fits, you know? Okay, so um, well, I know in our past discussions, a lot of times uh, these, these uh, conditions will have a genesis in um, only chemical activity, mm -hmm. and, uh, very much the so. poor, poor eating habits <laughs> yes, that yes. modern society uh, has accepted as normal. And, and I will say in a small island like Trinidad, yeah. the laziness of people. True. We're running now and we're buying everything in the grocery. Sometimes you have a little plot of land in the back, yeah. and you, you, if you realize how much stuff could grow on that. Yeah. I remember growing up when we have a little plot of land on the side of the house, and used to plant tomatoes and lettuce and cabbage and all kinds of things. Pigeon peas. And oh, pigeon peas was up the hill, okay. right? And, and cassava. Yeah. So you had cassava and pigeon peas growing in the same plot. Okay. Few ears of corn, you know, all kinds of things. Mm -hmm. And so when you're ready, you, you had a whole set of food coming off this little piece of land. Yeah. And you had food not only for you, but yeah. for the neighbors. Yeah. Like similar, I remember down the bottom, close to where the house was, we had a moko patch. Right, you know, it's moko, yes, yes. Uh, it's sh like a short plant. Mm -hmm. Right, and um, it w it was it was it used to bear profusely. Yeah. Right, and and you buy you take that and when it ripe you cut it open, mm -hmm. you chop it up, you fry it like planting, mm -hmm. and you're in business, mm -hmm. and and that used to supply not only the house but all the neighbors around because at any one time you look in the patch it would have three four bunches. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and you had, um, yeah, you, you had things like that, and and it, you know when you do that, it, it also causes you to think. You know, I remember once we had a little um, zabuka tree at the side. You know, it's a little bit of small zabuka sweet. Yeah. And one year, it no, was the purple skin one. No, this wasn't the purple skin. It was a green one. One year, it bare so much. All, all the branches was falling down and breaking and things like that. Mm -hmm. So we we had zabuka. We eat zabuka. You, you didn't want to see a zabuka. And all the neighbors got and all kind of things like that. So my father said, well, this is good. What we'll do is we will we'll fertilize the tree a little more so every year we could get a good crop. Mm -hmm. And he went and he get manure and fertilize, he throw a little fertilizer on top of that. And the tree come nice and big and green. <laughs> the next year it be oh, 10 or 12. <laughs> <laughs> so that made me realize that it had more to plants growing yeah. than than um, fertilizer, than fertilizer yeah. right? And then you know, years later, I came upon it. The 30-year 
uh, grain cycle mm -hmm. that exists in the in the stock market that you have certain grains that follow a 30-year cycle which is the same as the planet Jupiter okay. you know so it have things so that that aspect of it caused me to say well must have some record of that and one day I found this book which um, people who are in the stock market seriously mm. they buy it was more than one it's two books but what it has was the cycles of the planets mm -hmm. right to the cycles of the stock market okay. underlying the normal day to day okay. up and down and the little war and all that mm -hmm. so um, I says I will get that mm -hmm. so I got on to the people and I asked them I said well um, how much is the book the fellow said well, the first one is seven hundred and fifty dollars and the next one is eight hundred dollars <laughs> He says, and you'll have to wait for it. <laughs> you don't get it just so you just have to order it and wait for it. So I ordered it and I waited for it and it came. And it made fascinating reading. And then it occurred to me that that book, that those books, offer a select set of people. Yeah. And while they're doing that and making a ton load of money off it, knowing that from generation to generation, they keep telling you, the planets, they have no effect on you, man. All right, so they don't want you to enter into that realm of knowledge. No, no, no. They, they, they want, to, want you to think that you're existing alone. Mm -hmm. You know, when you grow up in a small island like here, mm -hmm. you know that come November, if you're going in the sea, mm -hmm. it's neap tides. Mm -hmm. Right? The, the, you're down in the San, the San Fernando Sea Wall. Mm -hmm. the, tide, the tide gets so big that it's coming up over the, over the wall and it's running into the scout house. Yes. So that is the time to run and jump up and dive down because you're not going to hit the bottom yeah. in fact just off that there you can't stand up whereas normally you stand up there yeah, yeah, yeah. so you have a difference about three or four feet and it has to do with the moon getting closer to the earth at a certain time every year mm -hmm. right and then you had tides according to the moon cycle this is, you know yeah. and, and then you, you had mcdonald's almanac which tell you don't plant root crops when it's when the moon rises and plant it when it's going down yeah. because it has to go down to make roots you go and plant it in the other one and you get you get ash <laughs> some little little dash sheet. so in the same place plant next to it and you begin to realize all these things have a cycle we have lost that completely yes, yes. you know Planting. i remember a couple of years ago i i did a program and i said um, that women follow the cycle of the moon so we're taking a few calls afterwards and fellow called this is all in this voice, oh, what, 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 what's this nonsense I'm hearing that, that, that women cycle follow the cycle of the moon? That is a whole lot of nonsense. Mm -hmm. And I said, oh, Sir, I want to ask you a question. He says, I say, Have any women in your house? He says, Of course. I have my wife and three daughters. I say, You have a wife and three daughters, and you don't know that their cycle is follow the moon every 28 days? I say, Well, you live in, you live in Mars. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I say, Go over and ask your wife. <laughs> just ask her and she tell you boy you're so stupid <laughs> and, and and from the from the culture and the tone of the voice he was obviously a very educated man yeah. he was so educated that he didn't know that all the women in the house attached to the moon cycle yeah. you know you know um, a, a lot of people walk around now and they have been educated away from the truth eh? yeah yes so we have to start asking what is education you know one of the one of the things i notice is that if you write a book you know i was talking once to a guy who had graduated in business studies and you know we're talking and he says ah well i'm doing a phd in you know, business studies you know and when i finish i'm going to get a job at one of the big firms and i am going to change the operation and make it efficient i say you are right See, that's nice. See, ever run anything in life? He says, no, no, you don't have to. Once, once, you, once you get educated, you could do all that. He see, I wish you luck. Right? He says, well, what do you mean? I says, to do business, the first thing you have to beg God for is cunning to wheel and deal. Right? I say, and if you just go to church and you're a holy boy, you're dead. That's because you'll find out that you have something stuck on the docks. And you have to find somebody who will get it off. Mm. Right? Mm. And, you, and you have to 
talk to them in order for it to come off. Yeah, you have to be the witness system. Yes. Yeah. I say, now, if you have morals and things like that, mm -hmm. you go down the drain so fast, your head will spin. So the, the kind of person you want to deal with is not the kind of person you want normally. You, you, see, so, you yeah. see, so, so what you have is, yeah. I grew up, and I grew up a good Catholic boy, you know, get in the thing, go in and things like that. And this is right and this is wrong. And I got thrown into society, Trinidad society. Eh, you watch the interplay. I was working in Fed camp. You have the white boys and the black boys, you know. Mm -hmm. And um, I soon realized that all the locals were afraid to talk to the white people. And one day I was trying to load the sulfur pit with a payloader that wasn't working properly. And I drive it forward and I easing it in so it don't get stuck so I could fill the thing. So my boss, incidentally, you had the same name as me, Mr. Meyer, right? Drives up and comes out. He says, what this is, what is she doing? That's not the way to drive the payloader. I say, ah, oh, Mr. He says, don't ask, don't tell me anything. You natives don't know anything about anything. So I get up and I say, I say, you know, you know what I do in here and you know why I do it like that. He says, of course, you don't have the sense. I say, why you don't come in and drive the effing thing and show me? Mm -hmm. And I jump out. Everybody stop. You jump in boy and you rev it up. And you drive it into this, into this sulfur pile. And, and it stick. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, yeah. So I'm going to say, you damn ass. That is what I try to tell you all the time. It ain't working good. And I'm trying to tease it. I say, what? You think I'm so stupid. I never drive a, a vehicle like that. I said, well, get your so and so out of there and let me do my job. And he get out, <laughs> and he never said a word. He go on. And we say, he could get you fired, you know. I say, no, he isn't. No, he isn't. He can't. He wouldn't do that. He, he, he's not that kind of man. He's a rough, white, redneck. He understands one thing. That is basic machine logic. So Christmas Eve night, we are in the, in the control room. I just went out to check the plant. And, and he comes in while I'm outside. He said, where is he? He's somewhere outside there. He said, all right, you come back now? He said, yes. So he sit down. He sit down and he pull out a bottle of rum and he pull out two glasses. So I come in. I say, good night, Mr. Meyer, how are you going? He said, I'm going good. He said, I'm you know tonight is Christmas? I say, yes. He said, I come here to take a drink with you. He said, no, I'm the boss of this plant. I know you're not supposed to drink, but you can take a little drink with me. So, he poured the drink and he handed me. He said, no, I come here to wish you Merry Christmas. Right? I said, no. He said, you're the only man in this plant that ever had the guts to tell me I was an ass. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I start to laugh and he start to laugh. And everybody stand up with him out open. So I take the drink, shake my hand. He said, I'm going up the road. He said, keep up the good work. He said, thank you, sir. And he go on. And he said, we thought we'd have fired you. I said, you don't understand people. I think because I'm 18 years old that I know how to cuss a man when he tell him his stupidness. Yeah. <laughs> so, so that's the problem we have. We don't speak up. We watch things going on and we moan and we groan. But we don't do nothing about it. Generalize. Right. We don't ask questions about the depths of what we're looking at. We don't get information. Right? I had a guy this week. He called back and called me to go and look at the little thing. And he do so. And he says, it ain't straightening back. I say, we'll call that trigger finger. He says, I know. I say, well, that is a caused by a B6 shortage in your body. You see what you mean? So I'll take 100 milligrams of B6 every day for a couple of weeks. I say, and it will fall back out. And you do it until the flexibility come back in your fingers. So he come this week and he watch and he say, this finger couldn't close tight, you know. He said, this one was triggering. He said, watch me now. And he closed the whole hand. He said, everything loose. He said, well, how come nobody don't know that? I said, that too simple. That too simple. So I pull out a set of notes I have there on, on, on B6. And, and listen to this one. Finger flexibility test. Put hand flat on the table and bend the middle joint of each finger. Right? So that the finger curls in onto the top of the palm. Right? If they can't bend properly, 
you need B6 vitamin B6 100 milligrams a day and check the results in one month now, how, how so often you just leave and you just go to the doctor and your finger can't bend and close and you still have rheumatoid arthritis yes when in actual fact most of the time you have a B6 shortage right or you have women, uh, men, and they come and they say, have a pain here, all right, oh, no. carpal tunnel, right? And the doctors tell you, well, if it ain't thing, get some painkillers, and if it ain't cure, yeah. we got to go in there and cut the nerve. Right? So you go in there and you cut the nerve, and you can't use the hand properly, but you see all the pain going. B6, 100 milligrams twice a day gets rid of carpal tunnel syndrome. And over the years I've been doing it, I would say 98% of the time. But you see that answer too simple, you know. B6 and vitamin C, 100 milligrams and vitamin C dramatically alleviates asthma. But I, know, I know that um, in our previous discussion there is um, synthetic and real B6. So we're looking at the real B6. No, you're looking, you're looking at, at, at B6. B6 most of the time, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Things you just get synthetic is like B12, mm -hmm. more than, right? But um, you're looking to at synthetic vitamin C, which is ascorbic acid. So it had to be ascorbic acid with cofactors. When my big daughter was small, she had two attacks of asthma. And I had a vitamin book at home, and the guy was saying, in order to alleviate asthma, get some B6 and vitamin C and, and give the person who has asthma. And I gave her B6 and vitamin C for about eight months. And she never had another attack of asthma. After two Ventolin is, uh, uh, things in the hospital. You, know, you understand what I'm saying? And, and you try to tell people that and they say, all right. And they'll start giving them the B6 and vitamin C and after two weeks they stop. Because they see the results they want. Okay. I don't know what ex what, how they expect the body to assimilate things. And you know, have people they come and they have a pain in their back or a pain in their hand and you give them medicine and they call you the next day and they say, I ain't seen no difference. I say, how long you had the pain? About eight years. So what do you expect? The, the stuff I give you will heal it and drink it. I say if, if if you want something like that, go and ask the doctor for the most powerful painkillers he have. Yeah. Right? Or better still go to the States and let them give you the real painkillers. A week later you're a junkie. Yeah. Right? I say, to fix the body, I say you get cut on your hand and the doctor stitch it up. He'll tell you come three, four weeks later to take out the stitches. And then he'll tell you, give it another month or two and don't rough it up, you know. If you break your hand, it's going to take you three, four months. If you break your foot, it's when he take off the cast, he'll tell you, don't put no pressure on it for about a year. If it's a serious break. And give you stuff to help build the bones. Yeah. Right? Natural stuff. So... That, so B6, vitamin B, B6 and vitamin C to dramatically alleviate asthma and tell people that they think you're crazy, you know. Uh, premenstrual edema, when women swell up before their periods, you know. Stop with B6, 100 milligrams of B6, right. Um, B6 deficiency and diabetes, scientist Yakito Kotaki, Japanese. Uh, tryptophan is metabolized um, using niacin, which is B6. Every amino acid in the body cannot be metabolized without B6. So, so any protein that you take in your body, if you don't have enough B6, will not work properly. So you have a person on the trigger finger, they're also telling you that you're not metabolizing the protein properly. Right? Um, Xanthurinic acid in the urine denotes a disturbed B6 deficiency. So if they check your urine and they find xanthurinic acid in it, it reduces the effect of glutathione. glutathione. And glutathione is one of the most powerful antioxidants in the body for the immune system. Powerful immune stimulator. Glutathione in the blood binds insulin, leading to increased change to, for chronic diabetes. In other words, it helps to relieve chronic diabetes. 
painful joints in diabetes can be relieved by B6 and extra magnesium. Edema in the hands and feet can be relieved by B6, 100 milligrams. It protects the microcapillaries in the eyes, the kidneys, and the heart from deterioration. So one of the main things about diabetes is that after a while chronic, especially if your sugar running high, the, 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 the insulin in the, in the system, the extra insulin that you're pumping in, tends to burn out the microcapillaries in the eyes and you start to have bleeding in the eyes. That with excess sugar. And once you have bleeding in the eyes, it means your kidney already deteriorating and your heart already deteriorating. So they're saying that um, if you take 100 milligrams of B6, it goes a long way to alleviating that and slowing it down. And then you get your, you get your sugar under control. So right? anybody with diabetes should be taking B6. Mm -hmm. A lot of people who have insomnia is a shortage of magnesium and B6. Right, so so you, take, you take a little bit of magnesium citrate or magnesium gluconate and 100 milligrams of B6. And don't expect to fall asleep the same time. You have to take it for a couple of weeks until it gets into the system and levels off. And then gradually you'll notice that you start to sleep better. So you, you take the B6 until it gets back into some level of homeostasis. Mm -hmm. And then you will start to sleep better. Extra B6 in an autistic child's diet mm -hmm. dramatically improves their behavior. We could go on, but we'll, we'll leave that for a while. You know? Maybe every time we do this, I'll give a little on, a little, uh, on, on anything, you know, things like that we don't, um, we, don't, we don't think about, you know. So let's continue. We're going, we're going. So we're going to talk about prostate. Um, having an inquisitive mind about six months ago, six or eight months ago. I had a lot of people coming in who were swollen prostate, the beginning of prostate cancer, what is the various chemicals that they give them to do what. And you say, well, you say I'm reading quite right. Why do we get prostate problems? I always say, God didn't we make a, a human being to have prostate problems starting at the age of 50, 60, right? Sometimes earlier, if you don't watch what you're eating and things like that. And you're getting earlier and earlier now. You know, you get people with prostate problems in the 30s. So I say, something not right. The other thing is, my old man was a tinsmith plumber and he had a little kind of machine shop on thing. He used to be right down in the back of Imperial stores in San Fernando. And exactly opposite, upstairs, was the Bamboo Inn, which was the nightclub of notoriety in the town with all the whores. And he'd been right across the road, and he being a drinker, all the characters that used to lime there used to end up liming by my old man. So I had Mr. Cyrano. Mr. Cyrano was drunken Dolly's big son. And Mr. Cyrano claim to fame is that he never used to get drunk. So people used to take bet, and he'd sit down, and he'd drink a whole bottle of rum and get up and go up the road. And he had muscles like a wool athlete. Never seemed to do any exercise. But he was a smuggler. He used to smuggle things from, from Venezuela. So you hear all kind of tall stories about how the Guardian run them down, and they went in the swamp, and they pushed the boat in a corner, and they went and hide in the water for several hours, and then they come out and they run when they go. So I grew up hearing them kind of stories. And then my father had a partner called Big George. Big George was huge. Big George used to load trucks for a living. In them days, they didn't have no truck with no um, back lift to, to run the gravel out. So normally, a truck used to have two people to load and unload gravel. That was the thing. George used to load and unload gravel by himself. You make a deal with the man. He says, I will do the work of two men. You will pay me. The work of two men. And he come by my old man and he get a shovel specially built. <laughs> two and a half times the size of a normal yeah. shovel. You know. I, I remember uh, 
one night we were getting ready to come up the road. And all the fellas and them was outside there talking and this big uh, Norwegian sailor, because you're right from Point of Pierce, so he used to come down and think, come across the road and he was a little bit drunk. And he see George and he see, I want to ch challenge you to a fight. And George said, I don't fight, leave me alone. And he said, do it. And he keep pushing George. George hit him one hand and he was out cold. <laughs> the guy was about nearly twice his size and he was a huge guy. So you understand the characters used to learn by right? And, and, and then they had a special branch policeman who they used to call the ghost. Because everybody was standing up talking here. And somehow or the other, he would suddenly appear in the middle of everybody talking. And he said, We do that for ghosts. Who you always doing that shit? You know, and then carry on. <laughs> you know, he'd banter. But I was sitting down thinking, and I said, I never hear anybody complain about prostate. You know, nobody. How come you had all these macho fellas and none of them used to complain and all of them used to drink the guts out? So it puzzled me. So that set me off thinking there's more to this thing than meets the eye. And there's a, there's a thing about knowledge is that if you start asking for knowledge, it has come. I buy a book by a nutritionist. Mm -hmm. I can't remember her name. But she was talking about nutrition and the organs and things like that. And it was a really good book. And halfway through the book, it had a thing on prostate. And she starts the chapter by saying, before World War II, swollen prostate was unheard of. Just as I, went, I once read another book that says, before the introduction of hydrogenated oil, nobody used to have heart problems and clogged up arteries. Unless it was some weird DNA, RNA problem that that family had, you know what I mean? Other than that, nobody. So that when the guy who invented the, ex, uh, the electrocardiogram, electrocardiograph and he carried it to the hospital in New York, the doctors asked him, What is that for? He said, I said, Check the heart. They say, what, what use is that? We don't have so much trouble with the heart. That's the one thing that don't give us any trouble. Yeah. That's a whole turnaround. Yeah. So you recognize when you read history, Right? It's like reading history 200 years ago, mm -hmm. where all the Midwestern states in the United States, young girls, 80% of them used to have goiters. Mm -hmm. And just before that, they had, they had invented they had how to make iodine, how to isolate it. And then, you know, how to, I, um, Dr. Lugal mm -hmm. found that potassium iodide was an was a, 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 was a iodine that you could drink. Mm -hmm. Right? And they started realizing that people who worked in, in, in zinc mines, and some of the zinc mines had an iodine um, thing, and the zinc, right? That they, they, they never used to get swollen glands and things like that. Mm -hmm. So the, the United States government, the health committee, um, made a thing and said, what we will do seeing that the Midwestern states don't get any iodine in the diet because they don't eat any seafood where most of the iodine has come from. Mm. We would put it in the bread. 